everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, before I get into an introduction on Robin, I just wanted to give a little bit of context on the exhibition for those of you who haven't joined us before. So this is an exhibition. It's the first museum show for the LA-based artist Brian Rushford. He's a ceramic artist, as you can see. Um, and I visited his studio for the first time this last January. And as you can imagine, I was blown away when I walked into a small space and saw these crazy, colorful, wacky, bizarre clay figures. I guess they're not figures as much as objects. Um, one of the main threads that runs throughout the exhibition is Brian's inspiration that he has gained through his travels throughout Central and South America, as well as Eastern Africa. Um, these were not travels that Brian took in order to inform his work. It just happened to be that he finished a teaching job and decided he wanted to go traveling for a few months. He ended up uh, going to Hawaii and he wasn't satisfied with uh, the wildness that he found there. So he now makes an effort to go to really far flung locations, most of which are endangered and um, in a lot of the inhabitants and the flora and fauna that you find there are very rare. And that's really what informs a lot of the colors, the textures in his work. Uh, but one of the things that he always says is that when he started the travels, he became fascinated with holes in the ground. And hence we have this series called the Crater Series, which is modeled after holes in the ground that he continues to visit. Um, so as Monica said, when very early on, when I started talking to Robin, I was, or, sorry, when I started talking to Brian, I was like, I need to find someone who can give us more information on holes in the ground. <laughs> um, I am not a scientist by any means. I'm, you know, I, I grew up around the arts, I studied art, but this is something that I'm really fascinated in and I wanted to hear more. So did some research and Robin really jumped out and I reached out and I was really glad that he was willing to do this. So I'm gonna give you, read a little bio um, on Robin, who is an associate professor of geophysics at the Department of Earth Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received an M geophys uh, from the University of Leeds in, U in the UK in 2004, and a PhD in earth sciences at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. IGPP, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California in 2009. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique, the CEA in France, and a Cecil H. and Ida M. Green Scholar at IGPP. His research is focused on understanding the seismic and infrasonic signatures of the volcano unrest and eruption with application in monitoring and mitigating volcanic hazards. Please welcome me, in, or join me in welcoming Robin. Thank you so much. Okay, well thank you. Thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, and thank you very much Alexander for the introduction and thank you for this uh, invitation to come talk about volcanoes in this very interesting uh, Okay, so if we, if we look at our planet from space, uh, one of the first things that jumps out is that we are a watery planet, about 70% water covering the surface of the Earth. But if, with the, uh, the miracle of science and technology, we can, we can strip away the oceans, and we can see these uh, topographic features here uh, on the ocean floor. These are mountains on the sea floor, and these are actually all uh, volcanoes. These are where the, the, um, the oceanic plates are, are spreading apart about the rates that your fingernails were. So you can see that already uh, this is a volcanic planet, right? So this is one of the defining features of our uh, planet is that it's uh, volcanic. And actually all of that water, the atmosphere, the oceans, ultimately that results from um, outgassing from, from the Earth's volcanoes. So without volcanoes, there would be no life on Earth. So this is a, a photograph taken from my colleague on board the International Space Station, uh, Alex Gurus. This is some volcanoes in the in the Andes, you can see volcanoes from space. 
Uh, so a good question, first of all, is you know what what exactly is a volcano? It turns out that's actually quite a difficult uh, question to answer. This is uh, this is a natural um, phenomenon, and we're trying to classify it and describe it. So one so one definition is that it's just a place, a, a hole in the ground, as we talked about, yeah. where where a stuff is erupted, and that stuff is molten rock or gases. And then the other definition of a volcano is the actual edifice around that uh, hole in the ground, so the mountain. And we tend to use both interchangeably. Okay, so if you ask people um, what is a volcano, uh, or draw a picture of a volcano, most people would uh, draw something like this. They would think of this particular type of volcano. This is just one type of volcano. Okay, so this is Mount Fuji, uh, often um, often featured in arts and um, many photographs. This is what uh, Mount Fuji looks like. Uh, but there are many volcanoes like this around the world. This is Mayan volcano in the Philippines. It's a nice, tall, conical, symmetrical volcano. Uh, but they're not always this nice, regular shape. This is Mount Rainier in Washington. So it's more irregular uh, topography, but still this tall um, volcano. Great El Misti in Peru. Uh, Popocatapetl, a volcano I've worked on in Mexico. Uh, this towers over the central Mexican uh, region. Uh, how about this volcano? Does anyone recognize this one? It is, yeah, it's St. Helens. So this is before 1980, right? So in 1980, Mount St. Helens was transformed. So it was this, it was called the Fujiyama of America. And now, uh, this is what was left after 1980. So these are all a particular type of volcano that's called a stratovolcano. It's just one type of volcano. And stratovolcanoes are these tall volcanoes that are uh, uh, layers of pyroclastic debris. debris. I'll tell you what that is. And, and lava flows. Okay, so the thing I want you to, um, to take home is that this is just one type of volcano. We have other types of volcanoes, so uh, particularly in Hawaii, we've got shield volcanoes. Shield volcanoes are these broad, uh, symmetric, uh, not symmetric, very broad, uh, low topography, uh, convex shapes um, like this. And uh, basically the, the magma is more runny, so it spreads out over a larger area. It's called a, called a shield volcano because it resembles a, a Greek warrior's shield in shape here. And as I mentioned, in, in Hawaii, there's, there's lots of these shield volcanoes. So down here uh, in the southeast part of the island, this is where it's most active currently. But the, the big island, the island of Hawaii, is a composite of five different shield volcanoes. And in the center here, you've got this giant uh, Mauna Loa, and you've got uh, Kilauea, uh, which is grown on the side of Mauna Loa. So Mauna Loa is actually the world's largest volcano by mass and volume. It's just that uh, most of that mass is, is underwater. And so you know, if you're on Hawaii uh, and you're walking around, you can barely tell that you're on this volcano because it has such gentle topography like this. You have to get up in the air before you can, you can see it. But, but most of that is underground. So here's Mauna Loa here compared to Rainier from scale. You can see that uh, Rainier is, is tiny compared to Mount Mauna Loa. OK, so there's, there's different types of volcanoes. I just mentioned two of them. There are many uh, different types of volcanoes. And there are different styles of eruption. So this gives rise to this uh, large range of different behavior. So uh, volcanologists talk about um, a, a spectrum of processes. We have, on one hand, uh, effusive uh, eruptions. So effusive just means that you have runny lava uh, that's, that's not exploding, just kind of uh, producing lava flows, maybe from fountains. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got explosive eruptions. So this is a very violent uh, process. And volcanoes span this, this spectrum, this range, right? And um, and this is controlled uh, by two, two major factors. So the first one is the amount of gas that's in the magma, so we call this volatiles. And then the other, the other factor is the viscosity of the magma, so how, how sticky uh, that magma is. Okay, so this gives rise to a variety of eruption styles. Salt plays out in very complex ways, very complex chemistry. Okay, so uh, examples of effusive behavior, uh, lava lakes, uh, these are very eye-catching. These are often in documentaries and videos and things, but they're actually relatively rare. This is uh, one of only about eight uh, lava lakes in the world, uh, depends on how you count, um, in, in Africa. Um, so lava lakes, uh, lava flows, lava fountains, this is all what we would describe as effusive, uh, very relatively gentle volcanic behavior. Okay, and then when you go to explosive, there's a huge variety of ways that volcanoes can explode. Uh, levels of violence, levels of volumes, amounts of material that can be erupted. This is on the small end of what you would call an explosive eruption. This is what we call a volcanian 
explosion. This is from Sakajira in Japan. You can see that there's a, a shock wave that goes through the clouds. And then basically the volcano flames water produces this ash, this tephra, pyroclastic material we call it. We can see blocks were being thrown out. And we have this very loud shock wave as this pressure is uncorked. So these, some of these blocks being thrown out probably are several meters, maybe about the size of a car. You can see them flying through the air. Okay, so this, is, this looks very violent, uh, but this is actually uh, very, very short in duration. So volcano eruption, which is named after Volcano in uh, Italy, is, is this very brief, uh, violent type of explosion. So it only lasts maybe tens of seconds to a few minutes in duration. Uh, incidentally, Sakurajima is a very, very interesting volcano. It's, it's very persistently active. That, that video was obviously taken uh, during the daytime. At nighttime, you can actually see uh, this glowing, uh, this glowing material, this glowing pyroclastic. We call this incandescence. So if you have a long exposure photograph, you can see this. And lots of nice photographs of Sakurajima. Uh, this is uh, volcanic lightning. This is something that volcanologists are really interested in now. So uh, it's been known about for for a long time, documented, but. Uh, Volcanologists have been really interested, interested in the potential for lightning for helping to monitor volcanoes at distance. So, uh, lightning <coughs> travels at the speed of light, so you can detect it um, all, all over the planet. Okay, so, so Plinian is just one example of uh, explosive eruption processes, but on the other end of the scale, we have even bigger ones, so we have Plinian eruptions. And Plinian eruptions can last for hours, uh, even days in duration. Uh, and these are, of course, named after, after Pliny, Pliny the Younger, who first described these in accounts um, of, of the 79 CE eruption of Vesuvius. Pliny the Elder was, was killed during that eruption. And uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't really have very many uh, nice photographs and videos of Pliny eruptions because they're quite rare. But nowadays we have all this nice uh, smartphone citizens and science type stuff. So um, a couple of years ago, Cal Luca in Chile wrote it, and he's got spectacular videos and photographs. Everyone was taking pictures of this uh, fantastic plane eruption. Here's an example. This was Sinabung in Indonesia a couple of years ago. Uh, someone just took this, this video of a plane eruption. You can see it's just uh, unlike the volcano eruption, which was very brief, uh, very violent process. This Pliny and eruption cloud is sort of hanging out in the atmosphere and slowly being fed by this very energetic uh, jetting from, from below. And it's being, it's being convected up into the atmosphere, a bit like a hot air balloon, so it's, being, it's thermally buoyant. Uh, and it can reach, they can reach up to the stratosphere. Okay, so all of this is driven by, by magma. Magma is very complicated stuff, and uh, there, there are certain volcanologists that spend their entire careers uh, studying the chemical and physical properties of magma. And it's complicated stuff because it's what we call a multi-phase mixture. So it's not just liquid rock, it's actually solid bits, liquid bits, and uh, gas phases. So it's, it's, that's what we call multi-phase. And this is, uh, the melt is a liquid bit, the crystals uh, are solid, and then bubbles, a very complex uh, flow behavior. Uh, this is the kind of model that the volcanologists would, would uh, use maybe to talk about uh, the inner workings of volcanoes. So you've got uh, exchanges between the liquid phase, crystals dropping out, uh, gas pressure building up. Okay, so why, why do volcanoes explode? Well, uh, so the, the first order explanation is basically that you've got gas in the magma, what we call volatiles, and uh, these under certain conditions become pressurized and then they want to explode out. So you have huge volume expansions of the gas phase, which is driving the eruptions. This video here is, is one of these early internet uh, memes, I guess, uh, from, from YouTube. So this is where you add uh, Mentos to a bottle of diet soda. And this, this causes the, 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 the carbon dioxide to, to, um, to rapidly um, coalesce and produce these bubbles, which leads to this runaway um, process and produce a foam. And this volume expansion of the CO2 bubbles in, in the, in the diet soda is actually very analogous to what happens uh, in a volcano. So it's, it's these bubbles, it's the gas phase that's expanding rapidly that drives the explosion. Okay, so in volcanoes we've got these volatiles. So the word volatile just means it's a chemical element uh, or compound. It's something that can boil easily, can change phase very easily on Earth. Um, water is, is one of our main volatiles. And it turns out that uh, water is the main volcanic gas. So it actually, uh, 
perhaps I can put that in the next slide, but um, so water, CO2, and SO2, those are the main volcanic gases, and these are all dissolved in the melt, right? So as you bring that magma to the surface, a little bit like the diet soda uh, bottle, uh, the bubbles start to form, they start to expand, and under certain conditions, they can just lead to this runaway process, uh, which we call fragmentation. Okay, so we've got water, CO2, SO2, those are our main volcanic gases. Just water and CO2, that's 90% of all volcanic gases. And then we've got some of these other more dangerous gases mixed in there, H2S, carbon monoxide, hydrogen fluoride. Okay, so I've said this already. And uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that the volume expansions are huge, right? If you take a one meter cubed sample of rhyolite magma, that's a typical uh, volcanic magma, and you put that at depth in the earth, it has a typical temperature of 900 degrees centigrade, um, and it's only got 5% uh, weight of water. So that means 5% of that block, one meter cubed of magma is, is water. If you bring that to the surface, that can expand to 670 meters cubed of water. So it's just a, uh, orders of magnitude volume expansion. So this, this is why it, it's so explosive. Water is the primary explosive ingredient on, on our planet. Okay, and then you have other uh, peculiar things that happen, some non-intuitive things. Um, so for example, magma chambers uh, can be stalled in the earth. They, they can be stalled at depths of neutral buoyancy beneath volcanoes. And over time, you get uh, something like an underground distillation. So what happens is, as the magma gradually cools down, these crystals drop out. But because the magma is not all the same stuff, different uh, chemical uh, parts, components of the magma drop out at different temperatures. And one of the, the counterintuitive things that happens from this is that actually you pump up the volatiles, so you actually end up um, filling this magma chamber with more gas, and you also end up making the magma more viscous. So what you would think, right, that uh, when you leave a magma chamber in the earth and let it cool down, that's going to be less likely to erupt. But actually what happens is over, over thousands, hundreds of years, you've got this magma chamber, it's cooling down, but that actually makes it more likely to explode because you're pumping it up with gas and making it more uh, viscous. Okay, so, so yeah, so that's why you can have a volcano that could sit there for a hundred years and then suddenly explode. Okay, so we're on a volcanic planet. How many volcanoes do we have? It's like another tough question to answer. It depends how you count. So if you only count the volcanoes on land, what we call subaerial volcanoes, and you only count volcanoes that have erupted in the past 10,000 years, uh, then there are about 1,500 of them. The Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program in Washington, D.C. Uh, tries to keep track of that. If you go further back in time, of course, there are, there are more, uh, but they're harder to find. And this, we use this, uh, so if it's erupted in the last 10,000 years, we call it potentially active. It just, just means that it's, it's likely to erupt again. So these are the, the volcanoes that we're concerned about. Uh, but if you then include volcanoes underwater, then it's much more, it's, it's more like millions. I mean, actually don't really know uh, precisely what's going on in the ocean floor. Until, until about uh, 10 to 15 years ago, we thought that all volcanism on the ocean floor was effusive, so it couldn't explode. It was just this kind of gradual lava flows. And then this um, paper came out in 2008 from some submarine remotely operated vehicle observations in the Mariana Trench, and they witnessed firsthand explosive eruptions on the seafloor. So we've got explosive volcanoes happening down at uh, uh, a few kilometers of water depth, which is really surprising. Uh, so volcanologists are trying to figure out exactly how this works because you've got immense water pressure on top of the volcano. You'd expect it uh, not to be able to explode in this way. It's amazing footage that there's no sense of scale. It's just we don't know how big of an area we're looking at. Yeah, that's right not, on this video, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So this is a uh, typical seafloor event. This is probably uh, a few tens of meters across. Yeah. So this has recently made headlines. Uh, so one of the things, uh, explosive volcanoes on the seafloor, they'll produce pumice rafts. Pumice is this lightweight, frothy uh, volcanic material is full of gas, so that's can actually float on water. It's a solid rock. It's so lightweight that it can float on uh, water. And this can be transported thousands of kilometers, and, and little uh, uh, biological organisms can, can hitch a ride on that. That's the uh, way that um, organisms can be transported around the ocean. This is also hazardous to, to yachts um, and shipping. Uh, so, um, so this can happen. Yeah, in, in old um, navigational charts, there are some islands uh, called Phantom Islands that were um, erroneously mapped, and it turns out people would think they were pumice rafts that were being mapped, mistaken for 
uh, for islands. Okay, so as I said, uh, the, the, the volcanoes can basically just sit there for tens, hundreds, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, and then because you've got this distillation process in the magma chamber, they can suddenly erupt without warning. So, this, so we all we have to keep in mind that we're, we've got this um, collision of time scales. We have geologic time, which exists on a million year time scales, and then human lifetimes, but we've just arrived right at the end. So we're, we're, we're witness to, the, to this last uh, glimpse of, of what's happening uh, on this, on this uh, epic story of the Earth. Okay, so how many, uh, how many eruptions are there? So you know, most people think there's, there's probably eruptions are quite rare, but on average, you can expect about 20 eruptions happening anywhere on the Earth uh, as we speak. And about 60 uh, volcanoes of the, uh, of the world will erupt any given year. Uh, and then, yeah, so another, an obvi another obvious thing about volcanoes is that they're hot, right? So um, the, the hottest lava flows in, in Hawaii are about 1,200 degrees centigrade. That's about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, how do we know this? Well, volcanologists sometimes get brave and go and poke thermocouples inside uh, lava flows. Um, so this is one way to do it. But you can also do it with the thermal infrared cameras. You can actually do this from space using satellite methods. So we've known, we've known that volcanoes have been hot, they're producing all of this uh, magma and water. We've known about this for thousands of years. Stromboli, for example, in, uh, in Italy has been active since Roman times at least. And so this is fed into our uh, thoughts about what is happening in the interior of the Earth. So we've always known that there's been heat coming from the interior of the Earth. We've always known that there's been water. Uh, and so here's one of the early models of the Earth from 1664 what we thought the interior of the Earth looked like, the basic elements of fire and water. Nowadays, we have a, a different picture of what is going on inside the Earth. And thanks, to, basically, to seismology, by studying the propagation of earthquake uh, seismic waves through the Earth, we can uh, get the internal structure. So we've got uh, an interior uh, solid metal inner core here. This is overlain by a liquid metal outer core. It's about the temperature of the surface of the sun. And then we've got the solid silicate mantle, so this is solid rock. And then on top of this, we've also got solid crust, a little bit lighter weight than the mantle. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the mantle is solid. It's not liquid magma, it's solid. But yet, on million years of time scales, this mantle can slowly creep, uh, slowly convect. And so this gives rise to this very gradual uh, convection process, and uh, a little bit like a, a pan of water that's convecting, except that the pan of water is actually solid rock. You can move on million year time scales. And uh, so this gives rise to, uh, to plate tectonics, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of before. Uh, but the idea is that these plates on the surface of the Earth have been dragged along by these mantle, mantle convection cells. It's important to keep in mind that all of this is ultimately being driven by a heat transfer. We've got an incredibly hot interior of the planet, the heat is trying to escape to space, and this creates convection in the mantle, and this causes uh, plates to drift apart, continents to drift apart. Um, this is all very well, very well known. So here's, uh, this is South America uh, drifting away from Africa here over the last uh, uh, couple hundred million years ago or so. And uh, this is on the left here is what we call a subduction zone, and then we've got a uh, mid-ocean spreading center here where the plates are splitting apart. Okay, so, so volcanoes happen generally, for the most part, at these plate boundaries. It happens where the tectonic plates meet, uh, but not always. So, so we've got uh, mid-ocean ridges where we've got uh, volcanoes on the seafloor, and we've got subduction zones, so this plate is being dragged down to the mantle. This produces volcanoes, so Mount Fuji, Mount St. Helens, all those stratovolcanoes. volcanoes. Those are mostly subduction zone volcanoes. But then we've got these other kind of weird volcanoes, like Hawaii, it's just in the middle of a plate. We call this intraplate volcanism. It means that it's a, uh, a volcano in the middle of a plate. So here's the, here's the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Plate, and you've got Hawaii right in the middle of the plate here. Um, so this kind of geologist um, had to add this interpretation to the plate tectonic model, uh, this idea of mantle plumes. The idea is that you have these buoyant upwellings of material from the core mantle boundary, a bit like a lava lamp or something, and this ascends to the surface and uh, basically burns a hole in the, in the crust. 
Okay, so um, so yeah, I wanted to, to specifically mention uh, craters. Volcanologists have got lots of nice names for different volcanic uh, features, and I thought craters was relevant. So a crater specifically is this uh, bowl-shaped uh, edifice, uh, bowl-shaped opening at the top of the edifice, sorry. And uh, a crater is formed essentially by blasting out material. So you have an eruption, you're blasting out these gases, and a pyroglass, and then you have this erosional feature here we call a crater. They're not caused by collapse into the ground. That would generally be called a, a caldera. And craters are, are quite small on geologic scale, so less than a, a kilometer. I mean, uh, that sounds quite big, but uh, a crater is quite a small geologic feature. Uh, here's, a, here's a photograph from uh, Tungurawa volcano in Ecuador. This was taken by one of my colleagues at, at Ecuador. You're looking at a crater that's about 300 to 400 meters in diameter, so a very uh, huge crater. Okay, so what happens when humans encounter volcanoes? As I said, you've got these volcanoes existing on geologic time, and humans come along. And we tend to think of mostly about the hazards that volcanoes produce, but, um, but volcanoes also bring lots of natural benefits uh, to humans. And so uh, we sort of think of volcanoes as having this dual nature between providing uh, benefits to humans, but then also um, creating destruction. So even, even the earliest humans uh, were living near volcanoes in East Africa, uh, where humans first emerged. It's a very active uh, volcanic area. There's lots of volcanoes there. And so uh, ever since the beginning, we've been using volcanic materials. For example, obsidian is a type of volcanic glass. It's formed by a very rapid uh, cooling of, of a certain type of uh, lava. And it's very good for producing uh, sharp tools. So it's been used in, in arrowheads things like that. I understand even, even surgeons nowadays, uh, some prefer to use obsidian, obsidian blades. Uh, as I mentioned, in East Africa, uh, we've got evidence of, of um, hominid and, and human uh, footprints in volcanic uh, tephra deposits. So we've got literally evidence of, of uh, early humans stepping through volcanic deposits. That's how we know about footprints and things like that. Um, volcanic materials, it turns out, also when they break down, provide very nice fertile soil. So they produce lots of nice uh, plant nutrients. And so volcanic soils, or endosols, uh, are, very, are um, as a whole on the earth, uh, very, very productive, important agriculturally for, for forest products, um, all kinds of products. Uh, you can remind yourself of this when you go to your favorite uh, grocery store. Uh, you'll often see associations, for example, between coffee and volcanoes. Uh, but it's not just, not just coffee. Here's an example uh, from um, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, all these nice products that we grow basically from volcanic soils. And um, so these sort of um, subtropical islands with the, with the nice um, warm weather and, and uh, re high rainfall with, with, um, with this volcanic material produces this very rich soils. Okay, so this then creates uh, a challenge because people want to live close to volcanoes because they want to farm the, the soils that the volcano is providing. So this means then that the people are in harm's way. This is one of the photographs I like to show. So this is the 1991 eruption of Pinachibo. This is the second largest eruption of the 20th century. It's a, what we call a DEI-5, it's an enormous eruption. And you can see that there's a farmer here in this field with their caravan still farming their field because there's pressure on that person. Uh, presumably their livelihood depends on farming, so they'd rather take their chances with the volcano than uh, and lose their livelihood, which depends on, on farming. So this is typically the, uh, the way people end up in, in harm's way. The most extreme example I've seen of that, uh, this is from Pula de Hua, from a volcano in Ecuador. There's uh, people literally living in this old caldera floor. This is a volcano that erupted uh, last time 2,300 years ago. And you can see lots of uh, farming fields in the base of this caldera. So um, you know, it's a very good lifestyle, lots of nice crops, but this volcano could awaken again, and so it's important to, to monitor this volcano. And when volcanoes do erupt, they, they produce um, problems for us. Um, of course, if they, if they blanket crops, uh, they, can, they can cause crop damage. It turns out that uh, volcanic ash gets coated in um, and basically soluble salts and acids, so that can cause poisoning of crops. Um, fluorine uh, is present in uh, hydrogen fluoride, and so if, uh, if that gets onto crops, you have grazing animals, sheep, 
in cows, they, they, can, they can consume a lot of that ash, and this can uh, lead to, uh, to bone and teeth uh, deformations and, uh, and death. Okay, so yeah, so so hazards on the one end of the spectrum, we've got we've got effusive eruptions, we've got lava flows. Um, these are sort of less dangerous, but still dangerous. Generally, lava flows are quite slow, um, unless they're really going down a steep slope. So as long as you keep your distance, uh, for example, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is very good about um, advising people where to go. Lava flows generally are not not too hazardous, um, but. The problem with lava flows is when they intersect with, uh, with property, right? So you have buildings and infrastructure that's built in the wrong place, um, and the lava flow is just going to plow through that. So really, lava flow hazard control becomes um, land, use, uh, land use planning. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, volcanoes also produce, produce gases. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but, but one of them is, is the sulfur gases. So you've got SO2. H2S, so this acid stench gas, rotten egg smell gas. Uh, these are very harmful in high concentrations. You can see a volcanologist um, wearing a full hazmat suit here to do their work. In, in Hawaii, you've got this, uh, um, well, they used to have this very sulfur-rich plume here. This, this white plume you're looking at is mostly sulfur gases and water. And so in Hawaii, they have a, a VOG forecast. VOG is this uh, type of volcanic smog. And when the VOG is high, it causes uh, you know, these symptoms like watery eyes and breathing difficulties. Uh, so it's, it's something uh, that is, that is e even communities that are far from volcanoes can be affected by these gases. Okay, and then there's the ash itself. So what is ash? So basically ash is very tiny fragments of rock that are, pro are produced by pulverizing this magma into small droplets. And ash is a, it's basically a grain size definition. So anything that's less than two millimeters in diameter, if you pick up a piece of this material, if it's less than two millimeters in diameter and it's volcanic, uh, it would be called ash. Uh, we have different names for the other pieces at different grain sizes. But basically it's been blasted by this explosive eruption and, it, and it's fragments of glass, minerals, and rock fragments. The way it's produced uh, is, I like to use this analogy of a, an aerosol spray can. So you can imagine, in an aerosol spray can, you've got this liquid uh, here that's under pressure, and when you press on the spray can, you lower the pressure so that you get this eruption of this material. And so then you've got entrained air here. We've got these little droplets of liquid and solid that were in the aerosol can. And so, uh, and these little droplets, we call them aerosols. And for a volcano, we actually use the same term. We, we, we talk about volcanic aerosols. Uh, so you get, it's the same thing. You have, you have a magma liquid mixture here. This gets blasted out, and you have these uh, tiny droplets of liquid magma that then suddenly cool and become tiny uh, rock shards. So here, for example, is a picture of a, of a piece of ash under the microscope. And uh, if you look at this ash, so this is a scale bar here, and that's just uh, half a millimeter. You can see these little uh, glassy, glassy fragments here. And sometimes it's very angular because it has uh, gas bubbles in there that have expanded, so you've got these very uh, sharp edges on this ash. Um, so you can imagine that if you were to breathe this in, uh, this would not be good. So um, this, some of this ash looks like it has this kind of razor blade-like appearance under the microscope. And so this is something that, uh, in, uh, so there's actually been some, some quite nice medical research done now on the, the health effects of volcanic ash, and we're starting to get a better understanding of that now, and we're starting to be able to make um, better recommendations about how people should be protecting themselves when they're exposed to volcanic ash. Okay, so here, for example, this is the person that was not wearing a respirator mask. We now recommend uh, that you wear these uh, PM25 masks. And, and this, there's all, all kinds of good information now about, about what you should be wearing. Okay, so um, another thing about ash is it can build up on, on rooftops. And if you just have a few meters of ash, it basically has a density the same as about uh, seawater. So a few meters of, uh, of ash building up on a roof that can cause the roof to collapse. This is a common problem. Here's a school that was uh, collapsed uh, near a volcano in Indonesia. Uh, this is a US Air Force near Pinatubo. The roof collapsed uh, just, just from a few meters of this ash because it's, uh, it's rock, basically. And then you also have uh, the pyroclastic flows. Uh, pyroclastic flows are created for, from a, a variety of ways, but um, one of the main ways is that if you have this clean eruption column that's trying to ascend in the atmosphere, with this thermal buoyancy. If you have enough gravity pulling down on that, the column can collapse. 
And so you have this gravitational flow downhill of, of this pyroclastic material. It's a very dilute, ashy mixture with very hot gases. The temperatures can be thousands of degrees uh, centigrade, so it can incinerate anything in its path. This is someone driving away from the, the eruption of Pinatubo. So yeah, this is a, these are the, the most lethal aspects of, of volcanoes. Uh, mud flow is also very deep. So uh, this is a photograph that I took uh, in uh, the Sufri Hills volcano in Montserrat. This is the town of Plymouth that was actually buried in the late uh, 90s by a series of, of mud flows, uh, lahars, as we call them, and pyroclastic flows. But fortunately, uh, this town was actually empty when this happened because uh, the volcano has been very well monitored by monitoring scientists. They'd actually issued an evacuation warning, and so there was only a handful of people uh, that, were, that were killed, which um, could, have been, could have been thousands of people. Nowadays, we have, uh, for example, uh, Vesuvius volcano. as uh, a notorious example in, in Italy. Uh, Pompeii, as, as I'm sure you've heard of, and Herculaneum were destroyed by eruptions of Vesuvius in 79 CE. You've now got something like uh, 600,000 people uh, living within the same distance of the summit of Vesuvius as Pompeii, so about 10 kilometer distance. Uh, it's about uh, three to five million people living in the greater Naples area. So evacuation uh, would be very difficult. And this is something that volcanologists uh, concern themselves with. We meet uh, at conferences every few years to try to figure out how best to handle this. Uh, but you know, so there's something like uh, 500 million people worldwide that are directly exposed to these volcanic hazards. Uh, but um, you, don't, you don't have to live right next to a volcano. There's also um, uh, aviation hazards. So this is a, a map of the world's uh, flight routes. It's a visualization of flight routes. So um, the, the bright uh, lines correspond to high density of flight routes. If you overlay um, the tectonic plate boundaries here, and then also the red triangles are the volcanoes, uh, you can see that many of these flights uh, traverse volcanic regions. So for example, if you take a flight from LA to Tokyo, you're going to go up over the Cascades, you're going to go up over the Aleutians, down the Kuriles. Uh, there are volcanoes that, that can erupt uh, without warning, put ash into the atmosphere, and um, basically um, ash melts at a temperature of about 1100 degrees centigrade, and jet engines operate at a higher temperature than that, so the ash can melt and this can cause engines to stall and fail. Um, and this has happened in, in a couple of instances, it's been uh, near misses. So we have, we have protocols now for clearing airspace, closing airspace, when volcanoes have erupted. And um, this was something that the public um, did not really appreciate until very recently, but in 2010 we had the eruption of Enefjetli Yekut in Iceland. And just the airspace closure from this incident alone uh, is estimated to have had an impact of about five billion US dollars uh, globally. And this is from um, people's canceled uh, travel plans, but also from, from trade disruptions, manufacturers working for parts to arrive. Okay, so for all of these reasons, it's very important to, to monitor volcanoes wherever we can. Most volcanoes actually are not monitored by, by local instrumentation. Uh, that's largely because it's, it's pretty expensive to, to, to monitor volcanoes. So volcanoes out in the Aleutians, out in the Kuriles, places like this, these generally have, have no instrumentation on them at all. Uh, but when we, when we do have instrumentation, these are the kind of things that we can do. So we can, we can measure the gases. We've got various ways of measuring gases. We've got nice cameras now that can, that can uh, image the plumes and, and detect the chemical species in the plumes. We've got uh, video cameras that can keep track of volcanoes. We've got satellite measurements. Uh, we can measure ground deformation. So with GPS and satellite observations, we can actually see the bulging and swelling of the ground uh, associated with magma intruding from below. Uh, but the one I want to finish talking about today is by monitoring volcanoes by looking at the earthquakes and by listening to the sounds that they produce. Okay, so, so with seismology, so when we're measuring earthquakes, basically what we're doing is we have some instrument just a cartoon here. Uh, but we're measuring, we have shaking basically. So we have a mass on a spring, it's, shape, it's measuring a ground motion. If there's an earthquake somewhere, it's going to produce seismic waves. The seismic waves will propagate towards where the instrument is. This will shake the instrument. We can record it on a, on a piece of paper, but more typically now we record it on a, on a digital record. And it's been known uh, for 
over 100 years now that when you take seismic instrumentation, so this is for detecting earthquakes, and you go and put it on a volcano, you get uh, you start recording very unusual exotic earthquakes. They're not like ordinary uh, earthquakes. They're not like the kind of earthquakes we get here in California on the San Andreas Fault. So we get unusual volcanic earthquakes. They're mostly small magnitudes, which are less than magnitude two on average. Uh, the, the largest uh, volcanic earthquake would be about magnitude five. Uh, they can be produced by, by stresses on faults. Um, they can be produced by, by the magma itself, so ringing and oscillations in the magma column. And then also uh, magma and water uh, interacting underground in explosive ways. So uh, it turns out that these uh, seismic signals, I'm just going to start this here. If you record these at volcanoes, sometimes it's going to give you a warning that the volcano is about to erupt. So what you're listening to is a seismogram. So you've taken the digital record from the seismic instrument. And this is lasting uh, this amount of time because we've got a few hours worth of data. And we've time compressed that digital record. So we've sped it up by 100 times. Uh, so that means you can actually listen to the, the seismogram. You're listening to the, the seismic shaking sped up. Right? So this is uh, real time has been sped up by two hundred times. So what you can hear when you're listening to this is a lot of individual popping sounds. But what, what the seismometer is actually recording is all these individual earthquakes. So, you, so this uh, here, uh, I'm going from left to right. These individual earthquakes appearing. You go down the, down the screen here. So every, every time you hear a single pop, that's one earthquake of the volcano. So at this point, it sounds like a popcorn machine or something. Uh, this, this is just uh, the volcano is producing so many earthquakes. We actually call this a uh, swarm of earthquakes or tremor. And then eventually, uh, this builds in such intensity uh, that we have a major eruption. evacuate people um, away from the volcano. So th this is this is a, a nice example where, where it works, but, but often it, um, the volcanoes don't behave themselves, so they, uh, they, uh, they don't uh, behave in the way that we expect them to. So they don't always um, they don't always produce these precursor signals, but when they do, we want to be able to, to detect them. So this is this is what happened uh, at the end of that sequence there. Okay, so volcano monitoring scientists use seismic waves to issue warnings to people. Typically, the way that we do this is we like to use a simplified method. So we use a traffic light a warning codes, so green to red. It's something that has been shown to be a good way to communicate hazards to the public across different uh, cultures and language barriers. Okay, so the, uh, the research that we do in my research group at UC Santa Barbara is um, not, so we, we look at these seismic waves that the volcanoes are producing, try to understand how those are being generated. But we also record atmospheric acoustic waves. So these are pressure waves going through the atmosphere, as opposed to the seismic waves that are traveling through the subsurface. And it turns out that these produce uh, very complementary information. So the seismic waves are telling you about what's going on below ground, all these subsurface magma, water, motions. And then once it gets into the atmosphere, it's actually erupting producing maybe a plume or an explosion, uh, then this acoustic method is, is a really good way of tracking that. And these are uh, happening at very low frequencies. So your ear can hear between uh, about 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. That's the range of human hearing. So above 20 kilohertz, we call that ultrasound. And so ultrasound is what uh, bats will use for echolocation navigation. Um, and we also use it in, in medical uh, applications, of course. And then, so, but uh, down, down on the low end of the spectrum, below what we can hear, we call this infrasound. This is the name that we use to describe these very low frequency acoustic waves. It turns out that the, the physics of these acoustic waves is actually the same as ordinary acoustic waves, it's just that we can't hear them. Our, our ears filter them out, basically. But it, it corresponds to um, sound with very large wavelengths. So we're talking about wavelengths that are tens of meters up to uh, 
uh, kilometers in scale. So it's produced by very uh, large things uh, on Earth. Um, and you can see volcanoes are in this diagram here. Here is, here is this different uh, phenomena that produce infrasound. You can see that uh, nuclear tests here is, is one of the big sources of infrasound. And so historically, this has been our source of funding for developing infrasound research. So infrasound technology basically developed as a method for detecting uh, clandestine nuclear tests, so for enforcing uh, test ban treaties. So because of that, so in 1906, we had this comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty um, that was open for signature. And so because of that, that catalyzed all this really nice uh, sensor development. So we have very nice modern infrasound sensors that can capture uh, infrasound in the atmosphere and can also filter out wind noise. And you can, you, can, um, you can purchase these or you can build them yourself. And basically, uh, you know, what we've been doing uh, is we've been taking this technology and applying it to, to listen to volcanoes and see what we can learn about volcanoes from this nuclear monitoring technology. So, so here's an example of how uh, seismic and infrasound acoustic uh, data work together. This is from a, a steam-driven explosion at Mount St. Helens that we studied uh, in 2005. And uh, so just to give you an example, so here's the seismic data that were recorded from this eruption. So the eruption is in the middle here, and you can see these individual, uh, individual earthquakes, similar to the example we saw from the Caribbean, from Montserrat. Acoustics, what we get instead is before the eruption, there's basically nothing. This is just ambient noise in the atmosphere. This is being produced by distant storms thousands of kilometers away. And then when the volcano erupts, it produces very energetic uh, signal. It's actually uh, similar to jet engine noise, we call it infrasonic jet noise. It has uh, properties similar to, to, to turbulence jet engine noise. Okay, so we have seismic and infrasound data together. This is really nice. Uh, the seismic data can tell you about what's happening before the eruption. So this is two days worth of data before the eruption, and then after the eruption, there's all the earthquakes. And then infrasound is telling you about when the eruption happened and how long it lasted. So infrasound allows you to uh, reduce ambiguity and, um, and figure out what happened at the bottom. Another nice uh, aspect of infrasound is that we found that it propagates very long distances, so it can propagate for thousands of kilometers. Um, so here is our global infrasound monitoring network, the white triangles here. As I said, these were set up to monitor the atmosphere for, for nuclear tests. Uh, but the red triangles are, are all of our world's potentially active volcanoes, there's 1,500 volcanoes. The closest one of these monitoring stations to us is this pinion flagellum that's out in the desert near San Diego. Um, and so there's a, this is an international uh, UN collaboration. So we found, this is a paper that I led, uh, here's a Sarisha Peak, this volcano in the Kuriles. This exploded, erupted, and uh, there were no seismic stations on this, on this island. The nearest seismic station was 350 kilometers away. It did not record the eruption. And in fact, we were able to record the sound all the way over in Kazakhstan, 6,400 kilometers away. And it's because the sound gets basically trapped in these atmospheric sound channels and, and gets transported uh, very long distances. And this ends up um, providing uh, uh, very useful information. We can actually, uh, we have arrays of sensors so we can localize the sound. And we can actually use these uh, sensors to, to, to detect and locate the eruption. So here I'm using three of these arrays and we can triangulate, figure out uh, where the sound is coming from. So we can, we can get the accurate source location. And we can provide uh, detailed chronologies of the eruption. So this is five days worth of the, uh, the data uh, going uh, down the screen here. And you can see all these individual explosion packets. Each one of those is an individual eruption at the volcano. And it turns out that this is providing information about the chronology of the eruption, so the timing and the sequence of the eruption. And that's at a greater uh, temporal resolution than is possible to get uh, from, from satellite methods. OK, so finally, I know I'm running short on time here. But um, finally, I, I just I wanted to, uh, to say that so, so we're basically showing that we can, we can detect and we can locate these infrasounds. 
But ultimately, the, uh, the research now, the important research, is to try and figure out uh, more accurately how these sounds are generated. And so there are different ways we can do that. First of all, we can do laboratory numerical uh, computer simulations. But uh, ultimately, we also have to go uh, to volcanoes that are active and relatively safe to study. And we take our infrasound sensors there, and we record infrasounds uh, and study them so to try and uh, get better handle on, on how these are generated. So I, I chose this. This is just one field experiment that I've been involved in, but I chose this as a good example uh, for this context here. So we had an, an infrasound array here that was about two and a half kilometers from this uh, feature called Pu'u'o. This is in Hawaii. Uh, Pu'u'o actually is just a flank eruption. Um, so here's our inlet diagram of a shield volcano in Hawaii. Shield volcanoes often have this central summit region, so the magma goes to the surface. But it can also spill out um, on, these, on these flanks, uh, propagating along these rift zones. Here's another diagram in case that helps. So here's the magma coming up from the mantle. Here's Kilauea caldera here. And then you've got magma going out uh, through what we call rift zones. And then Pu'u'o is just one of these features that appeared on the, on the rift zone. So it just, you happen to have a secondary eruption site. Uh, here's another diagram of it. Okay, so in uh, 1983, uh, there was basically just a, an area of flat land, and then a new eruption opened up on the, the east rift zone of Hawaii, and we started to get this, uh, this feature here. So hopefully you can see why I've uh, chosen this example, because I think, uh, at, least, at least in my mind's eye, it looks like uh, many of the exhibits here. And um, uh, so, yeah, so this, this particular feature, we would call this a, a spatter current, when it looks like this. So this, so this is a spatter current that's produced by this, this spattering of this relatively effusive lava. Uh, but unusually, Pruitt Roar didn't stop, it just carried on. Uh, so this is later in 1983, June 1983. Uh, you've got this uh, spatter current building and building. And it just kept going. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1990. This is uh, a few hundred meter tall edifice. It's even got a lava lake in the center. Okay, so by the time I got there, it was 2007, a long time after it started. And by that point, Pu'u'o had grown to a few hundred meters tall above the space. It was about 700 meters above sea level. And uh, we camped out in, uh, in the jungle, basically, next to Pu'u'o for about uh, two to three weeks. And uh, we set up our infrasound equipment there. We were treated to some nice uh, sunrises um, as the sun came up behind the, the gas plume here. And we recorded, we recorded these interesting infrasounds. Okay, so uh, at the time, Pu'u'u'u looked, looked like this. This was the summit vent. You can see all these, these holes in the crater floor here. So we're over here, two and a half kilometers from Pu'u'u'u. And I want to play you some of the infrasounds that we recorded. So if you, did, if you look at the sounds, this is the waveform now. It's just very, almost this looks, looks like noise. But uh, because we have an array, we have multiple sensors, See my son like SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah. So this is the, the sounds from Pu'u'u'u that are uh, have been sped up by uh, 400 times in this case. So you can actually listen to the sound. And so even though it sounds like noise, you can actually tell it's just coming from the volcano. You can look about it. And we can actually see that it was coming from these individual uh, holes in the ground, which is localizing. So it turns out it's uh, lava flowing through these lava tubes, and then it's resonating with these lava tubes in the ground, and then the sound is escaping through these, uh, these lava tubes. This is one of the skylight uh, vents that was through the sea. This is a spatter vent here. So you can see this, the spattering of lava that's been produced. So this is a, a, a hole in the ground, basically, and beneath this is lava flowing in these under, underground uh, caverns. And so the sound is, is basically uh, radiating out of these under the sky. Again, this is, you know, this is infrasound. So when you're standing there, you can't hear anything. Uh, but you can, when you listen back to the recordings, you can hear the sound. Okay, so, so we, we come up with uh, some, some explanations trying to understand the sound. 
Uh, finally, I wanted to sh uh, show just a few more examples. I've also worked at uh, Popocatapetl volcano in Mexico, and uh, I was invited to work there with colleagues from uh, the university. UNAM there, we installed one of our infrasound arrays at an elementary school, about 15 kilometers from, from Popocatapetl. And um, at Popper, you can get these really unusual sounds. So here's, here, this is one of the, the seismic recordings. I just wanted to, to fast forward here to this part here. So again, this is seismic data uh, that's very low frequency, but when you speed it up, you can, you can hear it. Okay, and then the last thing I just wanted to show you is, um, so we, the most recent, latest and greatest experiment that we've done has been at uh, Yasser Volcano, which is in Vanuatu. And we chose this location just because the volcano is very uh, reliably active. And when you're going with lots of equipment, it's very difficult to set up and, and uh, install. You want to go to a volcano where you can guarantee that you're going to get uh, some activity. It's, uh, it's uh, it's difficult if you set up all your equipment and then the volcano shuts down and doesn't produce any, any signals for you. So, so Yasser is, is a very active volcano. It's just a strombolian system, similar to stromboli. So here uh, is me and uh, some, some graduate students, Alex Yetzi from the University of Alaska Ferment, uh, Allison Austin from UCSB. So here we're digging a hole in the ground to deploy our miniature broadband seismometer here. And it's being recorded on this uh, small data packet here, data package. Uh, these are all lightweight enough that we can we can hike them around. Uh, very lightweight, we can put them in backpacks. This is one of our portable infrasound sensors here that we can deploy very close uh, to the source at Yasser. And then, uh, you know, really, what has been a disruptive technology for us in volcanology is, of course, uh, drones. And for, you know, for hundreds of years of volcanology, the, the fundamental limit on being able to do volcanology was how dangerous they are. Right. So there's a limit to how uh, close you want to get. But with drones. Um, we can get uh, videos and photographs and angles that would never have been possible. And so uh, we can get uh, videos like this, for example. Uh, we've got multiple vents exploding. Uh, so now we can finally see what the volcano is doing. And we have our seismic and infrasound instrumentation set up. We've got accurate uh, constraints on what's happening at the surface. We've got our recordings of the infrasounds here. Uh, so this is the acoustic waves, the blast waves associated with the explosion. We've got these seismic oscillations here. You can see these little ringing. This is VLP events. Uh, I localized these. These are occurring about one kilometer below the volcano. It's associated with a big slug of gas uh, coming towards the surface. And so we can work with other types of volcanologists that can provide constraints on the magma chemistry uh, and put other kinds of constraints on, on the, uh, the magma properties like the viscosity. Um, and ultimately, uh, we uh, endeavor to produce the more accurate models of how these signals are generated, and that will help us to, to better monitor volcanoes so that we can recognize and understand the signals that we're recording uh, and help um, to uh, reduce um, risks and hazards from, from volcanoes. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks.